Hey guys, and good morning. So today we're going to be talking about several things in this video. The first thing I want to do is just kind of a recap of what we started last week with binomial nomenclature and classification in general. And then I briefly want to talk about what you guys were reading yesterday, what I had you reading about the problems with this classification system. Um, and we're going to look at that in a little bit more detail. I'm going to try and help explain that to you guys. Then we're going to look at the different kingdoms of life. So we're going to be looking at the broadest of these categories. We're going to be looking at the kingdoms and the domains. And then last but not least, I'm going to help you guys get started on your mini classification report where you're going to pick an animal or an organism of your choosing and you are going to give me its entire classification from kingdom all the way down or from domain all the way down to species and you're going to have to tell me what's unique about each one of those. But we'll talk about that at the end of this video. So first what I want to do is just kind of pick up where we left off. Last week we started talking about binomial nomenclature. And if we remember bi meaning to, nomial meaning name, nomenclature meaning name naming. So it literally means to name naming. All right. And this was the system that was uh, devised by Carl Linnaeus simply to help us get a better understanding or at least to hopefully simplify what had been so complicated for so many years with classifying organisms. Yes, they had these very large taxon that they could be grouped into, whether it be a kingdom, a class, a phylum, or a family, and whatnot. However, he wanted to have something extremely specific as well. That way, when you said something like Canis lupus, everybody knew you were talking specifically about this species of canine. And so that is how binomial nomenclature came to be. And it's a system that, for the most part, has worked pretty well for us. And the reason it's worked so well is because of how specific a species, like the term lupus, needs to be. And if we remember what a species is, a species simply, uh, our basic definition we had was a species was something that was able to reproduce with itself and have viable offsprings. Again, viable is the important term here, meaning that their offsprings could then have offsprings of their own. And so in other words, you could have a wolf and you could try and breed a wolf with, let's say, uh, a bobcat for whatever reason. All right. Well, first of all, even if you tried that cross, it's probably not going to work in the first place for several reasons. One of them being that they're not going to have the same number of chromosomes. Their chromosomes aren't going to be uh, similar to each other. And the DNA is just too far off. They're not similar enough. They may be in the same class. They may even be in the same order or a close enough order. However, their family levels or their genus levels are just too far off. Their genetics isn't going to mix. And so that's why they're going to be unique. However, we do start to find problems with this classification of species when we start looking closer at what we consider the family or the genus level. And so that's what I had you guys looking at yesterday. I had you guys reading in the book these uh, pages that discuss these problems, the problems with our modern classification. Again, for the most part, our classification system works pretty well and it helps us with everything that we need to for simply classifying organisms. But again, this is a uh, human made system and so it's not without its flaws, but it works well for what we have to work with. And so what are those main problems? It's mainly at that species level that we we're talking about. Because According to our definition of a species that we've been working with, a species is an organism that can uh, reproduce with each other and have viable offsprings. We said that the wolf and the bobcat could, could not, a wolf and a fox probably could not have offsprings, even though they are both in the family Canidae, they are too far apart. 
However, you get closer in the genus canine with a coyote, and you take that coyote and you breed that coyote with a wolf, and you get what's known as a kai wolf. Now, again, this is not a true species per se, because what we've done is we've taken this group, which is a unique species, they have different DNA than a coyote. That's another thing that we're going to use for classifying uh, our species is they're going to have a unique genetic code. In other words, like humans, we have our own genetic code that's different than, say, a chimpanzee or even different than a Neanderthal. Homo sapiens are unique in that sense, and so we are a unique species. Likewise, both of these animals have a unique uh, genome, a unique DNA to them. However, they can reproduce and they can create offsprings. Now, these offsprings are what are known as a hybrid. All right, so again, they're not a true species because they're going to be a mix of this genome and a mix of that genome. But we go back to our definition of a species, which means that a species is viable so it can reproduce on its own. And we find out that these so-called kai wolves are actually out in the wild and they can reproduce and so it's starting to challenge our ideas of what can truly define a species it's a very fuzzy line and another example that we often might think about or something that might be on your mind more so right now is that with uh, lions and tigers when you cross a male lion with a female tiger you get what's known as a liger and that's what's in this picture this is not photoshop they are huge animals when they are produced uh, again and this this goes more so with naming of hybrids but you know this is a liger if the male was a lion and the female uh, was a tiger if the male was a tiger and the female was a lion, it would be a tie-on. The male always comes first in the naming of a hybrid. But again, this hybrid, it's not technically a true species, and so even the term liger or tie-on, they're still what we'd consider common names. And what happens, again, our problems with modern classification is uh, these two animals, according to our modern classification system they are genetically unique and because of that genetic uniqueness they should not be able to reproduce and have offsprings or at least viable offsprings we can look at things like uh, a horse and a donkey and you cross them and you're going to make a mule now they don't even have the same number of chromosomes and so it's still tricky on how that works but nonetheless, you can get a mule, but the mule is going to be sterile. In other words, it can't reproduce after it's created. Once you have a mule, you just have a mule, and you can't start breeding mules. However, for the longest time, it was thought that uh, ligers were the same way, that because they are so different, and they're completely different species, they should not be able to reproduce and produce viable offsprings, but through different testings and different experimentation, we have been able to discover that if you take a male lion and a female liger, you can get what's known as a la liger. And uh, these la ligers are something that just until recently, we did not even know was possible. and. Uh, it was actually a uh, little zoo in uh, Oklahoma that was actually the first in the United States to produce a la liger. And some of you may know uh, this zoo that I am talking about. But nonetheless, uh, as much controversy as there may be, this was a huge breakthrough for us in this sense of genetics because now we understood that these ligers weren't sterile. 
they could produce viable offsprings. And so again, this is challenging our idea of what it means for an animal to be a specific species. And so this comes to the, this brings us to this idea of what a species is then and uh, the adaptations that we see within species and speciation. Should it really be a surprise to us when we see these new species arising or this ability to have such diverse genetics? And to that, as Christians, we would say, no, it really shouldn't be that much of a surprise. Uh, and again, we've talked about this with our creation evolution unit. We talk about natural selection. It's something that naturally happens in these Organisms have the genetics to adapt to their environment, and likewise, this hybridization allows them to do it because, according to what we would say, is that in the beginning, God created all the animals according to their kind. And so, this brings up what we call biblical kinds. All right, you do not have notes over this but you will have a question about biblical kinds on your quiz this Friday. And so I would just make like a little section for notes on the side of my notes wherever I could or uh, on your Bellwork paper. And uh, you should have read some about this yesterday. But again, I want you to figure out what biblical kinds are. And so this idea of biblical kinds comes from several different places in the book of Genesis. First being in Genesis 1, where it says God made the wild animals according to their kind, the livestock according to their kind, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kind. And God saw that it was good. All right. And so for the longest time, this idea of animal kinds was thought to be species. All right. In other words, out of the millions of species that we see on earth today, it was believed that they were all created just as we see them now, thousands or hundreds of thousands of years ago at the beginning of creation, and they've been stuck that way ever since. However, uh, with discoveries from people like Charles Darwin or just naturalists today who have done things with natural selection, we see that species have changed over time. And we can even see again with hybridization and how flexible and how um, vague the idea of what a species actually is could be. And so we've come to this realization that kinds, these biblical kinds, are not as fixed as we once thought or even as science once thought with species. And so the idea of a biblical kind, we would say that this is a biblical way to classify organisms and a biblical kind would simply be any type of animal that could reproduce with one another and give off offsprings they don't even have to be viable in this sense as long as they can reproduce and multiply and this idea comes from genesis 6 19 through 20 here where it says and of every living thing of all flesh you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds according to their kind, of the animals according to their kind, of every creeping thing on the ground according to its kind. Two of every sort shall come into the ark and you will keep them alive. Now this is talking again about the story of Noah's ark where he took two of every kind of animal with him in the ark. If you remember in the debate we watched with Bill Nye and Ken Ham, one of Bill Nye's problems with Ken Ham's ideas was the fact of how in the world could you fit every single living creature onto the ark when there's millions and millions of species. And Ken Ham's reply was simply that because you didn't have to take every single species. You just took two of each kind. All right? And so what would be a biblical kind? Well, we wouldn't say it's at the species level. So I'm going to go back real quick to our classification just so you can see that. Uh, and we have our kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species here. Species being the most specific, then genus, and then family. 
all right, when we're talking about what is a biblical kind, it's probably going to be at the family level, sometimes the genus level, sometimes the family level. Again, it's kind of broad because we're talking about biblical kinds, something that's thousands of years old from the biblical text versus something that's modern classification. So it's not going to line up perfectly, but we would say it's around the family or the genus level. And so what that means is going back here, for instance, in order to, let's say it's at the family level, and he had to take two of every kind. All right, does Noah need two wolves, two dogs, two coyotes, uh, two foxes, two dingoes? No, he just needs one from the canine kind. He's going to just need one from the cat kind. He's just going to need one from what we call the bear kind. And so again, it really cuts down on how many organisms he's going to need on the ark. And it, and this is also how we would kind of explain adaptation after the flood. In other words, speciation, uh, what we'd consider microevolution. So you are going to see organisms that are going to adapt from their environment, just like Ken Ham said. In other words, we're going to see that maybe Noah takes this wolf. And after the flood, this wolf is going to reproduce and multiply. And as it does, it's going to move into new places. Maybe some of them might stay with humans and they might become domesticated. Others might go into uh, drier climates where they're going to have to adapt with their fur or maybe to living in smaller areas. And so they're going to adapt, but all the genetics to create these organisms can be found in the primal kind, you could say, the first kind. And that's also why they can all reproduce with each other because of their common ancestry. So I know it's a little confusing here and there if you don't have these charts right in front of you and if you've never heard this idea before. But what I want you to understand again is just simply this. In a nutshell, we have our species level is the most specific. The problem with species though is sometimes it doesn't always line up with the classification that we've given it or the definition that we've given it and so it can be a problem for us when we're trying to classify and that's because they can produce hybrids sometimes which again probably shouldn't be happening but if we look at them all as being from the same biblical kind where they can reproduce with each other then that's going to be a different story all right so now we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna start to take a step back we just looked at species now we're gonna go back to going really broad all the way back to domain okay so the domains of life now for a long time when we first came up with this idea of having domains we had two domains of life. In other words, every single living creature uh, or plant or microscopic organism could be put into one of these two categories. It was either from domain prokarya or domain eukarya. And what these older classifications referred to was the type of cell the organism had. If you remember all the way back from our general biology when we talked about cell basics, you had prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. Your prokaryotic cells, those are going to be things that are simple. Remember pro meaning like prototype, before, karya referring to the nucleus, so these would be before the nucleus according to like uh, evolutionary scientist and so what that means is these are going to be your simple organisms things like bacteria and archaea which used to be classified together and we're going to talk about that in a second so in other words if it did not have a nucleus it went into prokarya everything that had a nucleus was in eukarya so that would include all your animals your fungi your plants uh, 
and these weird things called protists. And they have their own kingdom of life that we're going to look at. But first, again, it used to be eukarya and prokarya. However, now it's been divided into three domains. I know your notes say here, due to recent studies, domain prokarya has been divided into two. Uh, and that's true, because prokarya is now bacteria and archaea. Those are the two domains. And we still have eukarya as one domain. So now we have three different domains, with prokarya being divided into bacteria and archaea. Archaea, think back to our Latin, meaning ancient, the old. Uh, these are considered by some to be the oldest living organisms because they live in extreme environments, and we're going to look at that in a second. And uh, they aren't necessarily the same as bacteria, and they're kind of like eukarya, but they're not. That's why they're closer here on this phylogenetic tree. Uh, but nonetheless, these all used to be just lumped into bacteria. And for our intensive purposes in our studies, we're still going to consider these what we'd say archaea bacteria. Not true bacteria, but archaea bacteria. And we're also going to give them their own kingdom of life. So let's go ahead and take a look at the six kingdoms of life we're going to be talking about. All right, so first up, we have our bacteria kingdoms, eubacteria and archaea bacteria. Just like eukaryotic meant true nucleus, eubacteria means true bacteria, because these are the real deal. These are uh, what we consider actual bacteria, actual prokaryotic cells that are going to have very simple DNA compared to what we say the archaea bacteria are. And we're going to look into more detail on these in just a second. Next we have protista. Protista is weird, and I'm just going to leave it at that right now. And plantae, fungi, and animalia. And these are the six basic kingdoms of life. So again, our domains being the largest, and then we have uh, those three domains can be divided into these six different kingdoms of life with archaea and eukarya, or archaea bacteria and eubacteria being divided into the prokarya domains, which would be bacteria and archaea. And then animalia, protista, plantae, and fungi are all going to be the domain eukarya. So we're going to go ahead. We're going to look at the six kingdoms of life. On your notes, I just want you to go through and as we discuss this, write down a few examples of each and write down unique characteristics that are unique to that clad or that kingdom. What makes eukarya or what makes you bacteria you bacteria? What makes animalia animalia? All right. So first up is you bacteria. These are what we call the simple bacteria. This would be things like Streptococcus, which is this bacteria here. This is what gives you your sore throat. All right. Or E. coli, which would kind of be like these guys down here. They can also make you sick, but you have healthy ones at the same time. They're going to be prokaryotic and unicellular. That's going to be key for kingdom U bacteria, is that they are prokaryotic and unicellular. All right, they're also going to have cell walls. Their cell walls are going to be different than plant cell walls, but nonetheless, they do have them. And these other characteristics just kind of discuss what they do for us and what they do for the environment. They're going to be important in the decomposition with the nitrate cycles and things like that. They're also going to sometimes cause diseases, but they can also keep us healthy. And so here it says, have you eaten your healthy dose of bacteria today? If you had a yogurt for breakfast, you did. Because uh, yogurts are a uh, type of food that they will purposely put bacteria cultures in 
and you can even look on the side of your yogurt containers and you can look for the active cultures that are inside of that yogurt container and it will tell you what types of bacteria are in there. Those are what we call healthy gut bacteria. Have you ever seen any of the commercials like the Activia commercial or something like that and talks about a healthy gut? It's because of all these guys in your yogurt. And so just because they're simple does not mean that they are not important. All right, next up on our list, it's another prokaryotic group, but here's what makes these guys different. And this is the reason, like I said, that we had that divide in domains is because they are so different from the other bacteria. Yes, they are prokaryotic like them, but when we look at their DNA, how the adenines, the thymines, the guanine, the cytosines, how they line up, it's structured more like eukaryotic cells. And so that was enough in some sense to give them their own kingdom and then their own domain and also just simply where they live. All right, these are what we call extremophiles. Extreme simply meaning they're extreme, ophiles mean like they love. In other words, they love extreme places. That's why I got like this little guy and he's riding a skateboard and the explosion because he's extreme, all right? These are the things, the type of bacteria, again, not true bacteria, but these are the types of little single-celled prokaryotic organisms that you're going to find living at the thermal vents at the bottom of the ocean where it's basically boiling water. You're going to find these guys in the, the hot springs, you're, that's what a thermophile is. They live in extreme temperatures. Acidophiles are going to live in extreme acidic conditions. So like your stomach acid, there are bacteria that would actually thrive in that. And so that's another thing with these. And this is also where a lot of people um, have problems with them being considered ancient bacteria, archaea bacteria, because they claim that because they live in extreme environments, they must have been the first bacteria that were ever here on an ancient extreme earth. However, uh, some people like Hugh Ross have pointed out the flaws in that logic, simply stating that in order to live in these extreme environments, they need very specific genes to help them survive in these environments. They're going to need unique DNA. They're going to need special, almost eukaryotic DNA, which is not seen as being simple. It's very complex. And so it begs the question, how do you have complex organisms before the simple organisms, according to evolutionists? And so that's one of their problems here. But nonetheless, Kingdom Archaea bacteria, these are your still single-celled organisms, but their DNA is more like ours, and they live in extreme environments. Those are the important things from them. All right, up next is Kingdom Protista. Now, Kingdom Protista, they are like the junk drawer of life. And uh, I say that very uh, liberally, I guess, because they, it pretty much is. In other words, if it doesn't fit the definition of what should be a plant or what should be an animal or what should be a fungus it kind of gets tossed into this kingdom and this kingdom has been divided over and over and over again because of that reason and so this kingdom protista is what we consider our simplest of the eukaryotic organisms all right so again these guys are going to have a true nucleus uh, like we can see here in this amoeba or in this paramecium, or you can't see it here, but plankton. Plankton would be considered a protista. So with this slime mold, uh, so with these euglena, and they are just all very different organisms. That's why we call it the junk door of life, because some of them might act like a mold. Some of them, like this guy right here, your algaes, might act more like a plant, and others like your amoebas might act like an animal and then you could have things like euglena that are going to act like a plant and an animal and so it's kind of like 
how do I classify these? Well, we'll just put them in this junk drawer, all right? Put everything that doesn't make sense. Because the other thing is, they can be unicellular, which is what most of these protista are. But then you can also have multicellular protista as well. These are generally going to be what we call colonial organisms. In other words, they're going to be multicellular, that, or they're going to be unicellular, but they look multicellular. But nonetheless, they can be both. Some of them have cell walls, like plants and algae, or like plants and fungus, but some of them are not going to have cell walls, like animals. So again, it can be confusing from time to time. They can be autotropic, which means that they're auto, meaning self, tropic, eating. They're going to use photosynthesis to get energy from the sun, or they can be heterotropic, meaning that they're going to eat things, like paramecium they will eat things, or amoebas, they will kind of just give something a big hug with their pseudopodia here, and they will engulf it and eat it that way. And so they can be in place, or they can move, and they're just very, very unique, and we'll be talking more about them in the future. All right. Up next would be kingdom fungi. Again, in Carl Linnaeus's time, Kingdom fungi wasn't necessarily a thing. We had kingdom plantae, and fungi would have been incorporated into that. However, as our microscopes got better and better, and now we even can uh, sequence their genomes and their DNA, we see that they are nothing alike. The closest thing to being a plant that fungi might be would be what this is, a lichen. You see this growing on the trees and stuff. And... Even still, this is a symbiotic relationship between a fungus and algae, which would be a protist. All right, But nonetheless, these guys are going to have cell walls, which you would expect in plants. But what they're not going to do is get their energy from the sun. That's why you're going to find them in things like this pile of poop, or in dead, decaying things, or even in between your toes because they need to eat something, all right? They can't just get their energy from anywhere, so they are heterotropic only, all right? There are unicellular fungi. There are also vast numbers of multicellular fungi, and uh, they can cause infections and diseases, but they can also stop infections and diseases. In other words, they're used for antibiotics. That's what penicillin is. It comes from the fungi penicillium. And uh, that's to help fight off bacteria and different things like that. But again, just basic overview. We'll be talking about this more as well. Then we have kingdom plantae. All right, This kingdom and the kingdom to come after that one should be uh, extremely familiar to us. These are our uh, autotropic kingdoms. All right, Or this one is our autotropic kingdom. In other words... They're doing photosynthesis. They're going to get that energy from the sun. They're going to be found mainly on land. And they have specialized tissues. In other words, they're going to have organs. All right, A leaf is an organ. A flower is an organ. A stem is an organ. They're specialized in that sense. And, of course, they're going to have cell walls. And they're only going to be multicellular. There are no true unicellular plants. From time to time, you may hear algae considered a unicellular plant, but again, algae is a protist, not a plant. And then last but not least is kingdom animalia. And again, Carl Linnaeus uh, was a Christian, and he believed in God, and he believed in uh, pretty much a lot of the things that we do, but he still classified humans in this category because of all of our characteristics and even the fact that we are mammals. We produce milk, we have fur or at least hair, and we give live birth. And so we are an animal. We look at ourselves, we see that we are eukaryotic. We look at how we obtain our energy. We cannot do photosynthesis. None of these organisms here can do photosynthesis. So they are heterotropic. They have to eat things. We are all multicellular. There is no such thing as a unicellular animal. If somebody calls it a unicellular animal, it's probably actually a protist. All right? And a huge factor in animal, animals 
besides being heterotropic, is that we don't have cell walls. All right, and we are going to develop special tissues, specifically uh, something that's unique to animals is this idea of having like a gut. The simplest being sometimes what you can see either in a tardigrade or a water bear here, or you know worm. Basically, this ability to develop a tube that goes right through the middle of our body where we put food in and then the waste comes out. That's unique with animals. And so, again, pretty much all animals have that ability. Now, some people consider locomotion, the ability to move as a, a characteristic of animals. And you can because for the most part, all animals can move. That's also something that helps us to adapt to our environments that are around us. And so again, these are all just different examples. What is a tardigrade? It's this thing right here, uh, sometimes referred to as a water bear. And they can live just about anywhere and for just about ever. All right. So those are the six basic kingdoms of life. That's just a very broad introduction. And again, we go more and more specific and you are actually going to be going very, very specific with this tomorrow in your little kingdom or, or your little classification mini report. And I'm going to show you how to do that right now. Okay, so if you look in your uh, lesson plan, if you look at the supplemental documents for Wednesday, you will find this PDF Word document or link to this Google Doc that is the classification mini report and the point of this project or this little project is to simply look up your favorite organism whether it be a plant whether it be a protist a fungi a bacteria a uh, animal and even though they're not technically alive, if you would like to do a virus like COVID-19, you're more than welcome to do that. Uh, but that's going to be a little bit trickier, figuring out all these different classifications for the viruses. Nonetheless, what I want you to do first off is you're going to put, my favorite organism is, just give me the common name. And so, um, let's see, I'm just going to go with... Uh, I'm going to keep it simple here with the dairy cow isopods. All right, and uh, again, you guys know how I like my little roly polies, or it's a sow bug. Uh, that's what those are, and so that's its common name is a uh, dairy cow isopod. And if I were to look it up, my favorite organism scientific name it would be Porcelio lavis. So here, I'll write this out. So my favorite organism is This isn't my real favorite organism, but it's an easy one for this project to do. And because I'm showing you this one, you can't do this one. And its scientific name is Porcelio Lavis. Now here's the other thing. All right, if you're writing it out, you can either italicize it or underline it. Or if you're typing it, make sure you do one of those because again, it has to be written correctly. Genus capitalized, uh, species not capitalized, and italicized. And why is it your favorite organism? I just think decomposers are really cool. All right, and then you go through and you classify. So here's our classification from domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Well, we have our scientific name here, so we got two of them already done. Porcelio is the genus, and Lavis is the species. I don't know the family yet because I haven't looked it up. I can tell you they are in phylum Arthropoda, which is which includes all your. Uh, arthropods with the jointed feet like spiders, insects, all your other crustaceans which would be your class, class crustacea.
And I believe the order would be isopoda. And of course, again, these might be your trickiest ones in here because once you have your favorite organism figured out and once you have that scientific name, you're just going to have to figure these ones out because if you know what it is, in other words, a dairy cow, well, I know it's an animal, all right? So it's kingdom, animalia. And its domain, well, if it's animal, it's going to have a eukaryotic cell. So it's eukarya. All right. And I've just about done the entire project right here. The only thing I have not done is how it is characterized by. All right. And this is probably what I think you're going to have the most uh, time consuming part of it being is just figuring out these. Okay. So, in other words, kingdom animalia. King, this kingdom is characterized by. Dot, dot, dot. What did we just say Kingdom Animalia was characterized by? Well, they are going to be multicellular. They are going to be heterotrophic. No cell walls. And... They have a type of digestive system. We're just going to leave it at that. All right, arthropoda, they're characterized by jointed feet. That's what arthropoda means. They're going to have an exoskeleton, meaning they don't have a backbone, so they're invertebrates. Crustaceans, all right. Crustacea breathe with gills. It's going to be one thing, and then again, you can just write several other characteristics, and you're going to give me the characteristics though for each one of these. So what are, what defines an isopod? What defines a crustacean? What defines an arthropod? What defines an animal? What defines eukarya? And again, that one should be obvious. The cell has a nucleus, all right? And so that's the basics of what this classification mini report is. So if you have any questions, feel free to message me through Remind or any of the other. Uh, Remind is the easiest way to get a hold of me. So if you have any questions, just message me through Remind. And uh, remember, you have a quick Friday, and I will talk to you guys later.